Anthony DeRosa was a Jersey kid with a love of drawing who knew early on that a career in art was the road that he wanted to take. Although his parents were hoping that he would pick a college closer to home, Tony left Cherry Hill, New Jersey for the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, California, where he found that he had an affinity for animation. Mr. DeRosa's first job in the cartoon business was a summer gig with Filmation, but Disney soon beckoned. Starting at feature animation in the early 1980s, Tony broke in on The Black Cauldron and The Great Mouse Detective, but quickly hit his stride as a full-fledged character animator on Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, and The Rescuers Down Under. He worked closely with animator Glenn Keane on Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, and served as a supervising animator on Disney's other 1990s features, including The Lion King, Pocahontas, and Hercules. His most recent assignment was Disney's new short, Paper Man. We spoke in the conference room of the Animation Guild on February 17, 2012. We are speaking today to Anthony DeRosa. Right, known as Tony DeRosa. Tony DeRosa. So, you're an East, East Coast, uh, son of the East Coast. That's to begin correct. With, right? You were born and bred in New Jersey. Or well, not born in New Jersey. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, and then you, but you moved to Cherry Hill at moved some point. Moved to Cherry Hill. My parents, well, my dad worked for a company known as Diebold. They make a lot of these bank, uh, well, back then they worked in bank security and vaults and that kind of stuff. And they, of course, now make a lot of the ATMs you use. ATMs um, and voting machines. Voting machines. Anyway, he got transferred down to Philadelphia from New York as like a regional manager for oh, okay. service. For their you know, heading up their Philadelphia office, so we all moved. I think I was like three, it was like 1963, something like that. Okay. And uh, so we all tootled down to Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I still remember the big uh, Mayflower movers truck with the Mayflower. I don't know if you remember those movies. They still have them. Yeah. I remember that even as a kid. That was like, I don't know, for some reason. Maybe it was the early cartoonist in me. It's like that big Mayflower on there. You're big on visuals. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Even then. Was, yeah. So that might have led. But you started drawing in elementary school, junior high school, high yeah. school. Yeah, no, always. I always. Like so many you know, people that do this kind of job that we do, you, you were sort of like born with a pencil. Programmed right? to it from an early yeah. age. Yeah, I guess we're just visual. Draw then, stuff all the time. And your, and your first, the first animation that you, that really grabbed you, you were telling me earlier, was... Yes, Peanuts. probably, yes, the Charlie Brown's Peanut special. That's, uh, I guess I related to those characters in some way. Charlie really? Brown being a bit of a loser, I guess. Did Everyone you feel did. that Charlie's life paralleled your own? <laughs> it's interesting because I remember at some point, you know, you're sitting eating lunch by yourself. I always remember that one of Charlie Brown sitting on the bench. It's just a strip. It's not in any of the animated films, but... He's sitting on the bench and he's commenting, oh, there's the little boy with the ball. And he's running, and he's, he's just sitting there by himself and he's watching all these kids having a great time and he's just talking about them as he's eating his lunch by himself. And then his final thing is, he's, oh, there's the bell. <laughs> there's only 160 more days of school left, you know, as he walks off. And it's like, I don't know, there's something about that as a kid I kind of related to. Maybe it's because I didn't find school. Tremendously enjoyable, I guess, like most kids don't. But, uh, but now, did you? So you're drawing all the way through yeah, on your own. That's correct. So are you taking art classes in high school, or? Yeah, of course. Always signed up for all the uh, art classes. Which, in retrospect, you look back on that and realize, hey, a lot of these guys, a lot of these kids were taking the class just as an easy credit. For me, I always took it kind of more seriously, like trying to really do. What kind of stuff were you doing in the art classes? Were you just doing sketching, or were you doing painting, or were you doing... Yeah, everything. You know, like a typical high school art class project. You do, like, everything from collages to, you know, Sculpture. like... Sculptures. Sculptures to some life drawing to some still lifes to some painting to some, like, assignments, like... Yeah. Here's a poem, you know, put an illustration to this. And were you one of the stars? Uh, yeah, I was always point. considered one of the best, you know, artists. Although, and in, in later in high school, this uh, a, a kid who, I guess, immigrated from Italy showed up, and he was, like, amazing. He was just like, what's that? Michael he was. He was just, like, so good. I never know. I don't know what happened to that guy, but it was just, like, 
I was jealous of him because he was like, I, mean, I think one of the assignments I remember we had was drawing a skeleton. They brought in a skeleton. Draw it. I think they had put it like in a chair, like seated. And, you know, I drew it and it was okay, but his was just like, oh my gosh. It's like, it's like, it was like amazing looking. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, you saw it. That could be demoralizing. Yeah. I was just, well, it's kind of in a way good because it kind of makes you realize. Kicks up your game. You can, yeah, you you, you, know, you can actually do better than what you're doing. You're on board. Yeah, you don't want to be, so, you don't want to be so full of yourself that you think you know everything. I yeah. Think. Oh, yeah. That's an early lesson I think I, I got early on. That no matter how good you think you are, there's always somebody who's a little bit better. Always someone better. Always you can always improve. There's always something new to learn. As I was telling you earlier, I think that's one of the neat things about being in the animation business is every film, every year, you know, you can keep adding to what you know. Either drawing, acting, anatomy, understanding the subject. Now I'm doing, as we'll probably get into later, a little bit more in CG and learning more of the computer yeah, yeah. stuff and, and that. So At that things. period of time, what what art, what kind of art did you gravitate toward? I mean, outside of the art class where you're doing assignments, what are you doing on yeah, your it's own? It's kind of interesting because I think I gravitated mainly towards the real classical stuff like... Uh, I think my parents had gone to Italy for an anniversary and they brought back like pictures of the Sistine Chapel and you know, all these great sculptures of Michelangelo and Da Vinci and uh, who's the other big famous one? Bert, Bert, uh, I can't remember his name. Bert, Bertucci, Bertucci, something like the Bertucci, I think. All the Medici, all the yeah. people who were under the Medici umbrella. Yeah, and uh, I think that stuff was just really impressed me for some reason. I don't even know exactly why. Maybe it's because the human figures were so beautifully rendered and believable and proportioned. And so it's kind of interesting because I started copying stuff from books like Michelangelo. Then I actually, on my own, why? I don't know. Maybe I heard somewhere that Michelangelo studied anatomy. I started getting anatomy books and just started oh, okay. drawing bones and muscles. And and just on my own, I, I, I think I did get some. It, in my limited knowledge, I just started getting anatomy books. They weren't necessarily geared to artists. So part of it would be like the organs and stuff, but... You know, I would always gravitate to the bones and muscles. Then I think later on I got some books more geared towards artistic anatomy and artistic yeah. learning the, the essential stuff and as did, an artist. You, looking back, did that help later with your some oh, of your definitely. Stuff? I mean, I think I mean I looked back at my drawing in high school it was atrocious. You know, now, but I think all that groundwork I was unwittingly putting down, kind of it started kind of, making things like, click. Like drawing classes and. All that. Yeah, I kind of made things click like anatomy. years and years and years later. You know, you start putting pieces together like these disconnected things that you pick up, and then all of a sudden you start getting other pieces in the middle, and they, it's like, oh, I see, this kind of comes in like that, and then this piece here, and that fills in that gap. So, yeah, I, I, I guess just because I had this passion for just drawing stuff and understanding what I was drawing and how to. For me, the figure was always a big thing. How to draw a convincing figure. I would actually, in high school, shy away from faces a bit because it was like, mm -hmm. exceptionally hard. But I always remember, I think it was one of the Walter Foster books on <clears throat> drawing. Just remembering one little drawing. I, I don't even remember what book it was. But one little drawing of like this female figure in a corner. And it's just like so spontaneous and alive and dynamic but solid that just popped out to me I was like boy one day I'd be I hope I can draw that well where you understand what you're drawing to such a degree it's just like boom just like not even thinking consciously in a way mm -hmm. of what you're doing but you're, you're just doing like it by putting, reflex you're yeah just, just by putting rhythm. stuff in there and feeling more like feeling the attitude and the action and, and the dynamics and the acting and the, and the pose uh, rather than really consciously thinking about it, if that makes sense. So, I mean, that's to, to me, it's something about that one drawing, not that I even understood what it was that was standing out to me, but as I progressed through the years and, and honing my drawing skills, that uh, that's, that still stands out to me. It's something that, that was something to which strive for was achieving that standard of draftsmanship that could be spontaneous and alive but yet solid so hmm yeah
and you reached it seven years later when <laughs> well i don't know if i've re- ever reached it i mean you always you feel i always feel like you're a little bit shy of where you want to be i mean at least i do and i think i think in a way that can be good i i don't ever feel like i've arrived at the destination quite yet um i i can definitely look back and say boy my drawing is thousands of times better than when it was like in high school but oh sure yeah 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 but mileage yeah and it's like anything it's like a musician practicing an instrument you just keep you need to practice you need to keep doing it you know you just need to do it every day and if you you know, thankfully, I've been fortunate. I've been in business 30 years and pretty much been drawing every day. You get better. You know, you get better just by doing it. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's just drawing, drawing figures convincingly. That was always something I strived for. Caricature. Later on, I mean, cartooning was always part of it because that, that was... So you were cartooning at the same time you were doing... Yeah, a little bit, but my cartoons, I think... I think I, at the point, I think this is something you also learn as you, you go on. When when you're cart, drawing cartoons, in a sense, it's sort of a disconnect to drawing a life drawing. I mean, you, as you progress on, you kind of realize they're really the same thing, but just different proportions and different... One you're caricaturing and the other... Yeah, and so I think, uh, especially my cartoon back then was pretty horrible, you know, pretty stiff, and just like the typical cliche cartoon head and, and but, everything... You weren't necessarily at that period of time drawn towards doing animation. That was well in high school. In I sort house. of started making that turn. I mean, I, I think I, I always loved animation. I, I guess you, know, you don't really think. Well, at least a lot of kids don't think about c- careers when you're real young. Some do. I mean, I know my wife said she, I knew I wanted to be an animator because she she worked at Disney as well. I knew I wanted to be an animator when I was five or something like that. She did? She yeah, moved? she saw Fantasia. She but at five, Fantasia. you weren't saying, I've got to be an animator. No, no, I just loved to draw, you know. And I said the Peanuts comics were early inspirations for me, especially the Charlie Brown Christmas. I remember seeing that when I was like five or six. And yeah, yeah. There's something I really just hit me about that little short piece of film. Hmm. Um, just great characters, too. I think that was another thing I love about those peanut strips. The characters are definite. You see Charlie Brown, you know who Charlie Brown is. You know who Lucy is. You know who Linus is. You know who Snoopy is. I think we got uh, more sure. of that into our films. It's like there's no doubt when those Strong characters show up. delineation of characters. There's no doubt who those people are. Yeah. It's just like if you know people in your family or you know people you know well, you have no doubt who these people are. And that's that's what's great and about And he was this. good at sort of distilling down their character definitely. traits and, definitely. and doing it. Definitely. So that so, stuff was real early inspirations for me. So when we were talking earlier about Eric Goldberg was geographically close to where you were growing up at yes. about the same period of time, and though you didn't know him, That's you knew of him because... That's right. Eric Goldberg and I both grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I was on the west side. He was on the east side. He went to Cherry Hill High School East I went to Cherry Hill High School West. He was a, he's a few years older than me. So he's, uh, I don't know, we may have overlapped our high school years by a year or so. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, of course, we weren't in the same high school. So, uh, But Eric, of course, I was telling you as a, kind of as a kid, I think maybe junior high or high school, he had, was doing some films on his own with like a Super 8 camera and just, yeah, shoot one frame at a time, doing his little animation and... And he got some notoriety, local notoriety for that, and uh, showed up on some of the local kids' shows, no, most notably the Gene London show, which was a local Philadelphia kids' show. Became a show. local hero. Yeah, he kind of showed up there a few times, showing some of his films. So I remember seeing Eric as a Oh, kid. so you were aware of him. Yeah, I saw him on the show, I'm like, and he would show these little, I don't know, one, two-minute films. I don't know how long they were. but And just think, oh, my gosh, this kid did this on his own. It's like... For me, and I was telling you, to me, I was like rocket science. I was like, (laughs) I can just draw one thing. I can't even imagine how you make it move. But it was just uh, amazing to me. And, and of course, even back then, Eric's drawing was great. Pretty out there. Yeah, I mean, he would simplify it for animation purposes, but still great poses, great drawings, great acting, you know, very clear what he was saying. And And then years later, you... Work together. Years later, I met Eric, uh, I think after I finished up at Cal Arts, probably like 81. I think I just started at Disney. and 
think the first time I met Eric was a friend's house party. Yeah. And he, by that time, of course, he went off to London and had a Yeah, I, I guess I kind of talked to him, didn't realize who he was. But I realized after, anyway, that was the guy. That was the guy, the guy that was the, on the show, the show. thing, the thing there. That was that guy. So, yeah, then I worked with Eric, of course, on, well, I worked on a lot of the same projects as him, uh, Aladdin, and uh, then with him on Pocahontas. Right, he was the director. Looney Tunes and, and, and all that stuff, yeah. But we may be getting too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Well, so let's go back. So, so you're uh, finishing up high school. That's you're, right. Uh, you're a uh, so enthusiast high school. for for drawing, drawing, animation. Love, of course, watching all the great stuff on TV, the the Looney Tunes stuff. And course, how did you be, how did you make the jump from West Cherry Cherry Hill High School to Cal Arts in Valencia, California? Well, yeah, that's at the time the big Disney book out was this Christopher Finch book, The Art of Walt Disney, which uh, my sister, who had since left Cherry Hill, went back to New York to go into the fashion business, and she knew I was, you know, getting more interested in animation and that kind yeah. of thing, and she bought me that book, The Art of Walt Disney, I still have it, and what was great about that book, of course, you have to remember, this is before the time of videos, tapes, and DVDs, and uh, oh, yeah, internet, yeah, you yeah. could... The Disney films would come out once every seven years, and if you were lucky, they'd show up in a theater relatively close to your house. You could stop by and see it. But that was it. You'd see the movie. You couldn't stop it. The Illusion of Life wasn't even out. Illusion of Life time. wasn't even maybe was in the Gleeman, Frank and Ollie's Eye yet. Um, yeah, this was like late 70s, mid-late 70s. And so I got that Art of Walt Disney book, and you're able to look through there, and here's a background from Bambi. And you're like... My gosh, look at that painting. Look at the colors, the composition in that. Tyrus Wong. Yeah, and look at this thing here. And, and uh, I don't know if they really had that many animation drawings in that book, but it was more like finished stuff from films. Cell setups and all that. Cell setups, but just the artwork, just displaying the artwork. And as I looked at that stuff, I realized, well, the, the level, even though I didn't understand what, what it was, but I just could tell the level of artistry and craftsmanship and talent in that stuff was something way beyond what was I, I was seeing on television, oh, which yeah, is yeah, really yeah. what I would watch most of the time because that's what we had access to. So Budgets the stuff that were was a like, bit bigger. What's that? Budgets were a little bigger and Budgets they had were a bigger, little more time. Talent, you know, they had really talented people on those films that were really pushed to do something different and, and creative. Oh, yeah. Were. Oh, yeah. Um, not that you don't do that on TV, but it just seemed like the Disney stuff was pushed further you know let's say take this to a certain level and I guess all the my love for classical art kind of drew me to that I sure like, well it's because you know the, the flat UPA yeah Hanna Barbera style yeah it has its charms but it's considerably right. different yeah there's a something about the extra level of care put in or I don't know what it was just you know maybe it's more extra level of time you can put a little more time into that stuff so it, it just has an extra depth to it, and you could just tell it has something extra in there, and that really drew me to the Disney stuff. Even though I had some exposure to that, like I had seen Jungle Book, and of course Mary Poppins, I think was one of my earliest films I remember seeing. Of course, there's quite a bit of animation in that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Jungle Book, I love that, and you know that time like the Rescuers was coming out. I remember going to see that and just being blown away by, especially Medusa. You know the animation on her, which is later on you find out it's all milk stuff. It's really cool. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, was, I got more exposure to Disney stuff. Well, about the time The Rescuers came out, well, that was about the time you were graduating. From yeah, that's getting pretty right close. Now. But one, one story I do have from high school is I was getting into animation, and I guess there was a re-release of Alice in Wonderland coming out. I remember one of my best friends, John Donker, he, uh, we were hanging out and stuff. I said, oh, I want, Alice in Wonderland's going to be in the theater. I'm going to go see that. And it's like, really cool. Yeah, You should come go see it with me. And he's like, Giving me this look like little kid what? Stuff. Like you can go see that? I'm like, yeah, it's really cool. It's got like all these weird characters and it's it like, no, is. thank you. <laughs> it's like I started realizing how I didn't really fit into the quite the mentality of most of the kids. Your sensibility was different. From exactly, because I was all into Alice in Wonderland. So, but that was what was neat. Then <laughs> I'll jump a little bit ahead, but then backtrack. Once you get to Cal Arts, you realize, wait, there's a whole 
school full of people that think that way. I mean, That's that was right. a cool thing. You're among your own. So even though I was like 3,000 miles from New Jersey, it was like you're at home because you got all these people that are into this stuff. Same you're, stuff that you're in. Yeah, where in high school, I was like, I couldn't find anyone that would be into that. <laughs> um, but getting to Cal Arts was uh, kind of a unique story in a way. It's like in our junior year, they uh, at the school I was at, Cherry Hill High School West, they had this new thing, a computer, that you could fill out this questionnaire with certain criteria and say what you were looking for in a college. This is going to help you pick a college. And, you know, you fill out this questionnaire, and they feed the info into the computer, and once your list got down to, like, 20 or fewer schools that fill, meet your criteria, yeah. they will print out the list of the addresses and contact information of the school. So I did it. You know, I did that. And, of course, one of the things was, you know, animation, art, training, and, uh, you know, I got a list. I think my list was, like, five schools that met all the things that I was oh, really? interested in. Do you remember what those five were? I mean, I think one, one was, was Cal Arts. One was Cal Arts. I think it was Philadelphia College of Art and Design. There was one in Minneapolis and Chicago. Those are the ones I remember. There may have been one or two others. Anyway, so I uh, I got sent all you know out to all those schools and got brochures. You know, this is archaic now. Like now, you go on the internet. Then back then, you'd have to mail out a letter saying, you know, send me now info. You just, you and a couple of weeks later, you get something in the mail with a flyer or brochure and someone's business card, maybe that you could write to if you need more info. And gives you outlines for portfolios, and you send, you take slides, you know, of all your artwork, and mail it, and they would look at, you know, it's like crazy. But my dad, then I had a portfolio I put together with all my artwork from high school. My dad, you know, now, how long did it take you to put together the portfolio? Because you're a guy that thinks far ahead. Yeah, so. I don't even know. You know, it's like you did six months of gathering, and no, I don't. I, I just gathered stuff I thought was. Good. I had no idea. How do I know what's good? I, it's just such stuff I liked put it together in some kind of a portfolio that my dad took photos of and we print, you know, he made a bunch of slides so each school like could get their own copy and we mailed them off and, you know, I actually got accepted to every school which I was, wow. I don't know why, I look at my stuff. And well, like, your grades must have been pretty good overall. Right? Okay, I think I was like a B student. Oh, that's all right. You know, B plus, B in there somewhere. I had okay grades. I wasn't a genius. I, I wasn't taking really hard classes, you know, but I, I was okay. Your um, GPA was such, and your art chops yeah. were such that they yeah. wanted to have you. Yeah. So I, I. So if they've all accepted you, how did you winnow it down? To well, and I went to an interview at the Philadelphia College of Art and Design. I think that was the one my parents wanted me to go to because that's like right Close. across the river from Cherry Hill. They even bribed me with, "You can have mom's car if you stay." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah. and still back then, I I don't know that didn't impress me that much. Mom's car wasn't. I wasn't in the cars, you know, I wasn't, I, I, I guess I just thought a little differently. And it, it wasn't, wasn't yeah. it wasn't the draw for me. I mean, I, again, I was telling you at lunch, I kind of think, look ahead, I like kind of try to see things a little bit more ahead than the immediate reward. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, the car is like, I don't care, I don't care if I have a car, I don't, what do I need a car for? Um, so how did the interview go? The interview went well. Philadelphia, yeah, that went fine. You know, they, they seemed to like. But you walked away it. saying, nah, it's not quite it. Yeah, I think they offered it to me. The thing that kicked it, okay, this was, the, this was the kicker for me, was every school had, uh, well, they didn't have every school, no other school other than CalArts. CalArts was the only school you could get a degree in animation at right. that time. That was 1977, 78. CalArts had an animation program. That was like right. a whole, all and your Everywhere classes, else it's an art major. It's all like an illustration yeah. major, fine arts major. You had one semester of animation that would be it like one class where you would learn animation right everything else was learning illustration whatever it is drawing yeah, yeah. painting classical for which is great but you know i wanted to really focus on animation because i felt like that's something i really didn't know much about yeah because i and so even arts I, was it now yeah, for you me, had it was already no decided brain. that uh, okay you're gonna hone in on animation at some point you made this decision that uh yeah, I just think at that point I'd already decided, you know, I, uh, I, I wanted to get into animation. You know, it's, uh, 
ask me how, why, I, I don't it, know. It's it just, wasn't because you were doing the 8 millimeter films? No, it's just, I think maybe in my juvenile brain back then it was, I love drawing, I love cartooning. If there's a place where I can, you know, draw and get paid and get really better, you know, learn and get better at it, then that's the job for me, you know, to, yeah, to yeah. put what I love at use and, and someone pays me to do that. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, it makes going to work all that much easier. Because at the time, my, my first job, and maybe this had something to do with it, my first job was my uh, senior in high school. I was a janitor at uh, Cherry Hill Hospital. Oh. <laughs> so that was like... I hate this job. I don't, I don't want to be doing oh, that. If I have to do this every day, I'll, I'll kill myself. Yeah. And it was like yeah, yeah. just brain... I mean, I remember just sweeping stairwells and thinking, my brain is just going a mile a minute thinking of all these things I want to do. I washed and, dishes at the university commissary, so I know... Oh, yeah. I mean, my, and my brain would be like... I don't know where, just away. like everywhere except... Doing the job. doing this, and I'm like just doing the sweeping in a concrete stairwell, you know, and it's just dusty and dirty and cold, and it's badly lit, and and uh, you knew that you didn't want to be doing, and this that really motivated years. me to say, oh my gosh, I gotta Move find along. something that's rewarding, you know, just so a job to me was more than just getting a good paycheck or any paycheck. It was like I need to do something that's emotionally rewarding or something you can some connect reward. to yeah something that i love doing on it just on my own if i didn't get paid i'd love doing it so that's why i guess maybe that in a subconscious way maybe that's what kind of attracted hmm. me to it hmm. uh, in part i mean not not fully but it may have been part of the puzzle yeah so you decide on cal arts decide on cal arts of course my parents are like well i don't know we can't afford that that's way too expensive so i actually wrote to cal arts and say well i really like to come but I, I we can't i can't afford it so then they quickly sent back well there are scholarships and this and that and i don't you know so long ago i don't know I, somehow it worked out you know they gave me some money or i got uh some kind of that is you live in a little apartment nearby or did dorm, you live in the dorm went to the dorm right away I, I could I, a whole nother video on my dorm roommates and really <laughs> the sweet mates I wound up with yeah because I didn't know anybody so a lot of guys went and I was like okay I want a room with you know this guy so they who had was buddies. there who was that you were telling me earlier but who was there at the at the time that you went bouncing into Valencia? well in my class there were like Joe Raft Mark Han Mark Dindle uh, Brian McAtee my wife Barbara DeRosa Jill Colbert uh, who else? There's a bunch of other guys. Oh, Jorgen Klubien. And they Rick were upperclassmen. Rick Heinrichs. Well, these guys were in my class. Rick Heinrichs, Jeff, Jeffrey uh, Lynch, Lynch, Jeffrey Lynch, and uh, yeah, a bunch of others. Right. Then upperclassmen were like Lasseter. John Lasseter was still there. Tim Burton. Brad Bird had left already. John Musker had left. Uh, Handel Butoy was there. Yeah, yeah. Joe Lance Cicero. Was so guys there. that all became names. Yeah, Bruce Morris. Uh, yeah. Guys, Bruce is still doing it. Bruce is still doing it, yeah. Bunch of guys, yeah. I'm sure I'm leaving out tons of other. No, guys. it's all right. But that's yeah, and it was uh, so there was a lot of creative ferment. It was great, and instructors were amazing. With Jack Hanna leading the program, Bob McRae was kind of head of animation. Had T. He doing character design. Come on, I mean it's like yeah. Bill Moore, oh, yeah. our our design teacher, was amazing. I mean his class, I think, was probably to me the key class, color and design. Um, teaching you principles of color and design that you can, I still apply. I mean, every day I think of Bill Moore. It's like it's just like stuff that sticks with you. First two, yeah, two years. So what did what? Can you synthesize down to what did Bill say in those classes that resonates with you still? Or, I mean, there's probably a lot of stuff, but do you have a? Well, it's just basic. Core? design principles the joke is large medium and small you know that was like uh, assignment one you know in Bill's class he'd give you an assignment you go out a week you do usually a cut paper design you bring it in you paint up your assignments on the walls and Bill would walk up and down critique some people he'd really lay into and destroy you know <laughs> destroy their ego sometimes he'd just pull the design off the wall and throw it on the floor because this is terrible then others, he'd point out, okay, well, what, this is successful. And he'd point out why. 
but a lot of it is variety, the first thing you learn. Keep a variety, large, medium, and small. Uh, variety in shapes, the, the variety in sizes of things, variety in color choices, light, medium, dark, intense, medium, intensity, and... Contrast. Yeah, uh, muted. Yeah, it contrasts. That's the main thing. But in correct proportion, so that it's a pleasing design. But you learn all that gradually over two years. But if you were to boil it down into one thing, it's keeping a variety. And even in drawing, that's that's the secret. Variety. You don't want both hands up. It's exactly the same. Head. You don't want your drawing to be able to be bisected and the right and left side be exactly the same. You know, you right. want to tilt the head a little bit. You know, it's just a little, you know, maybe profile, one eyebrow, one eyebrow up a little, tilt, you know, turn the head a little this way, have the guy lean, you know, anything to get like what you're doing. You're leaning way over with an arm down, you know, yeah, yeah. legs crossed, you know, so it's, and that's what gives a life. When you look at real life, that's what you see. You see things a little skew, a little bit off. That gives an organic feeling and, and a, a pleasing design. Yeah. You look at good composition. That's what it is. A flow, but variety, variety of things. In a nutshell, that's how I would describe sure, it. Sure, But just amazing stuff. Then Elmer Plummer was our life drawing teacher. Ken O'Connor taught us layout and perspective. I mean, these guys Can't are legendary. Like, so many of these guys are just, like, legendary guys. And they were our teachers. And, you know, you get there 18, and you kind of feel that it's a special place. But now looking back, you realize, oh, my gosh, it's like you couldn't, it's only, yeah, it's only looking you back couldn't as when you're in the pay for anything better than what we got. With those guys, you know, they were all long-time Disney guys. They had like 30, 40 years under their belt, each of them, you know, and, and knew, they knew what they were talking about. When they told you stuff, they were telling you what you needed to know. They weren't giving you stuff that was frivolous or, or fluff, you know. Yeah. So did you stay through the whole four years? No. Well, back then, the back then, of course, it was almost meant you weren't any good if if you stayed four years it was almost because the, you know one hired you you know that's kind of the way it was back then um and it was hard you know i came out cal arts you know, was, you know as i said one of the best guys in my high school and then you go to cal arts you see oh my gosh all these guys are amazing in the past. and i'm like yeah i stink i suck compared to these guys and you're just looking at people's drawings and sketchbooks you're like oh my gosh i can't do anything like this but I think it goes back to my motivation. I'm like, oh, i got to work my butt off. And I think that's one thing that I've always had a pretty good work ethic, you know, to really just sit down and, and just keep doing it. You know, just if you're getting frustrated, that's okay. Just keep going at So you it. could see your learning art going up. Yeah, I, th I would say the first two years was really frustrating. My first year, I, I st every year I was supposed to do a student film. First year, I didn't even finish it. You know, I... Of course, you, I have no idea what I'm getting into you know, for a film. I think my first animation test was just animate something. So I did five drawings of this bear. He pulls down like a beehive, sticks his finger in, pulls it out, and then licks it. You know, that's it. He's getting the <laughs> I did like five drawings. I shot them on twos. You know, I think that it's going to look great. And it's, that's you know, it's like done. I'm like, what? What the heck is that? So that's like your first lesson in timing. And I didn't quite put together. And, of course, back then we didn't have the... Video, you know, the shooting technology. We could shoot on video, but it took me a while to understand, well, maybe you hold each drawing like 16 frames instead of two. I was a little slow on the uptake, you know, so I had started learning gradually that, you know, it's all about timing and you have to use the timing. That's the, the element of film. Reaction. Well, the, the element of film is you have time now. For, so I had my drawing that I loved, but I never worked with the element of time added to the drawing. So it took me a while to get you know, 12 frames equals half a second, 24 frames is a second, all that stuff. So year two. <laughs> yeah, so first year was frustrating. I felt like drawing I wasn't happy with, and, and I think Bill Moore's class was the thing I felt was I was getting the most out of because those are concepts I could grasp and kind of get. And I think I had one or two projects that he liked in that class. Second year was pretty frustrating as well. I uh, had a slightly more ambitious film. Now we, we work with sound in your second year didn't get that one done. But the thing that happened at the end of the second year is in Bill Moore's class. And he said, we, we've never, you know, I've always wanted to do this with a class. You know, he'd been teaching at Chenard's, I think, and now CalArts. And his thing was, I always wanted a class, as a group project for us, a group or a class to do a, a film, a design film, kind of like a Fantasia thing, just shapes moving to music. You know, and you guys would 
board it out, and then you you know make this little short film to a piece of music. So our class actually did that. We we worked and uh, boarded it out, and you know what was neat about that for me is I got to see close up how my other classmates that were doing really well, how they approached doing this stuff. So you get nice examples. Yeah, I got to see you know how Joe Raft boarded stuff and how Mark Hand was animating and Brian McEntee was doing his stuff and. Uh, guys that were hired, you know, that at the end of their second year at uh, Cal Arts, and uh, I start saying, "Wow, if you're just really methodical and really plan the stuff out, you can be very, you know, it's not so mystical and mysterious. You can yeah. actually like apply all the stuff that we know and make something that you have a, a little bit of control over, and then get something." kind of picture at the beginning can actually look like kind of like that and get something that's I don't know it took for me that was like a revelation yeah, it doesn't yeah, sound like a big deal but it is a big jump it was a big jump for me they're actually like carefully planned because I guess for me drawing was always a very visceral thing and yeah you plan but jumping from just doing one drawing was one thing but to apply it to this big thing over many frames and, and a big project well how it all interconnects yeah and, and so how, we, how to pace it yeah it. and and so we did that film as a class and showed it at the producer show and it got a really good reaction you know got a really good how reaction. many of you were on that five all together i don't know no it was a bunch i it was probably it was supposed to be a class project but i think most of the work was probably done by i don't know 10 or fewer people so um but yeah i remember doing my own little piece in there and it it was in there. It was in the film with everyone else's and it held up and it looked cool. So for me, that was like a breakthrough. So what happened then, I figured, okay, now got a process. I'm going to spend my summer between my sophomore and junior year storyboard my junior film so that September comes because one of my problems... Yeah, because one of my problems was I never had enough time to really animate it the way I wanted to. I always felt like I, I was rushing through stuff and I always hated that. I always wanted to be able to spend a little bit more time if I wanted to add something or work on my drawing or whatever it was. So the part of the frustration I always felt was the time was so short. So, yeah, I boarded my whole movie during the summer. I was telling you that was the summer I was sharing an apartment with Mark Dindle and Franz Vischer. We were all like three in this little apartment. And so I had them kind of banging ideas off of it. And then I just boarded everything out. So September comes, boom, I show Jack Hanna, who was the head of the program. You always had to show him your film. You know, September, I show him my boards, you know, like pretty much first week of school, and I pitch it to him, and he's like, oh, yeah, that looks great. And he made a few little comments, things he wanted, thought I could change, and I could kind of consider it, but I thought, no, I, I think I like what I had. I didn't really want to change it mm -hmm. too much. And he doesn't get bent out of shape? No, he was okay with it. No, he was he was okay with it. I mean, I didn't tell him that. I just did it on my own. I just, you just wound up doing it. You know? But he never came it. back to me with like... Wait a minute. You know, I told you to put the yeah, bumblebee no. in Yeah, the no, he didn't see anything like that. So I did. Like September, boom, I'm animating methodically. Just, you know, every day. You know, of course, we have classes, but your junior year, you're a little lighter on your class. Load. You don't, your core classes, like design, you don't have that. And um, I think you still, I, we still had Teehee with uh, character design and... I think the life drawing class has kind of let up a little bit in your third year. So I was able to devote more time to my film, and I, you know, I got it done. And at the end, it was still a crunch. You know, I still did. Like, but you got it done by the end of the year. End of the year, end of the producer show, and uh, it was like one of the funnest, best days of, the, of my life when you show your film and people are like cheering, they liked and it. whooping and laughing, and yeah. There's somebody it's I like interviewed really was saying like his film. God, who was it? Yeah, it was but, Franz. I know what you mean. Right, he was talking about It was about after Joe Ramp's film. He was right behind Ramp's yeah, film, yeah, yeah, and yeah, he yeah. said he I didn't get any him. reaction at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then Franz had a good film that following year, which is the year, the same year as me, because we were both take, we were both hired by Disney. Uh, so at the end of your third year, you're hired by Disney. Yeah, yeah. There was like 13, not all from CalArts. My wife was hired, Barbara, and Matt O'Callaghan was in that. Kathy Zielinski, Jill... Trousdale, Jill Colbert, Trousdale, and me and Franz and at that time there were only a handful of women in the program. Only right? handful. There's yeah. fifty percent now, yeah. but at that time I yeah, think yeah. it was more like eighty twenty. Yeah, no, even no, I don't even know if it was that many, just a few. Yeah. Ninety ten, yeah, ninety yeah, yeah, yeah. ninety two. Yeah. There's a few, just very few women. So and then there were some people that came in. It was like thirteen from other places, other colleges or other studios. 
and we went into the Eric Larson training program, like two months of training under Eric Larson, which again, that's like another level. You you do the Cal Arts thing, you think you know a lot, and I think I was telling you this later. You yeah, go yeah. to Disney, and then it's like boom. Well, all of a sudden you're knocked down you're again. Back, like, well, it's you're just, back to you leave high school a star, and then you're not exactly. a star at Cal Arts, and you leave Cal Arts a star now and at you're Disney. Back you're like at the who is this again. guy? So yeah, and then I started looking at all the stuff at Disney. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these guys are just way beyond what I can do. So, um, no, it's, training with Eric was great. I, you know, again, you do a film, a little short film at the end of your two month training, and it's reviewed for some reason. They kept me on. I my I, I just remembered my film being so horrible. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like the worst thing ever. Yeah. I, I, but they kept me. I mean, I, I wasn't an animator. I wound up going on into assisting and stuff like that. Some of the other people went right into animating. Really? Yeah, like, oh. uh, or assistant animating, that kind of stuff. I think like Matt got pretty early on into animation and Kathy Zielinski, Jill, and uh, I think my wife Barbara maybe as well. And Kathy's yeah. over at uh, DreamWorks. She's right. been over there for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so some of the people went on, you know, a little more advanced than where I was. I, I kind of was assisting, and uh, I think some of the first stuff we were working on was like Epcot stuff, doing cleanup because Epcot wasn't even open yet. Oh yeah, you know, they were like rushing to get you the last, all, you the last, the like film. the figment in the Imagination Pavilion. They needed cleanup. I did some cleanup on Bruce Morris animation for that, and a little bits of things for this and that for for finishing up Epcot, and uh, so that was like my first professional Disney job, you know. So that, that was cool. Wasn't exactly what I wanted. I was, of course, always had my eyes set on animating because I always love acting, I guess, was kind of in my blood to a certain degree. Well, your first job was between years at CalArts. You were you did some uh, freelance for right. filmation, right? Yeah, Franz Fisher and I had gotten some freelance work that summer. That was the summer I did my storyboarding on my student film. Actually, I first... Part of that summer, I was working in the shoe store, which was another brain dead job. I'm like, ah. So I, I, when the that. filmation work came up, I'm like, I'm doing that. You know, so I was, that was. What did you work on? Do you remember? I think like they were doing the Lone Ranger. Oh, okay, yeah, thing I remember then. that. So that was just like, do that, and it was better pay. We were working at home, and it was fun to be drawing and getting paid for it. So that was that was cool. Your first taste. That was your. That was your first professional. That was my first, day. yeah, paying real paying animation job. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, back at Disney. Uh, Working on that stuff. Then let's see. That's probably 1981. That's when I started at Disney. So I guess it kind of blurs together. Let's see. I think well, you were Christmas working Carol. on, at that point, there was Christmas Carol. Yeah, Christmas there Carol, I think, was the, the Great first. Mouse Detective. Yeah, that was later, though. And there was Mouse the Black Detective. Cauldron, and you were on that, too. Cauldron. You? But Christmas Carol, I think, was the first production, real production I worked on there. I don't think I have a credit on that, but I did. I did like assistant work. I'm trying to think. I think I did some in betweens for Glenn on Willie, the Giant. Yeah, yeah. Glenn, and for other people, oh, Rick he Hoppy. He reboarded that whole end of the show. Yeah, and I remember working with Rick Hoppy, doing some. He was animating back then, uh, doing some rough in betweens for him. So that was fun. I liked rough in betweening. That was cool, you know, because you do little bits of animation, little drag, and little. And it was cool to work with other people that had more experience and just see how they did the stuff, you know, flip real drawings and see things moving and shapes and expressions changing, the characters coming to life, even though it's just a couple of drawings. So to me, that was really cool to, to do that. And you're climbing the food chain as you... A little bit. Uh, went on then to uh, Cauldron would be the next one, because we're still in the original animation building on the lot. Yeah. Not you know. the original one, but you know the one on the lot. The, um, yeah, the... So that was Christmas Carol and Cauldron was the last one done in that building. And... Uh, they did a little bit of Great Mouse there, I think, too. And then they yeah, real on. early on. But by the time I was on Cauldron for until that building shut down, that was we were like the last people there. But they, I was on Cauldron. I did a lot of assistant work for Phil Niblink. He did a lot of the Horned King and Creeper, the little Creeper guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I did a lot of work with Phil on that, and uh, yeah, he was he was primarily. So well, you were you were among the last last of the people out of the original well the original main yeah lot because what happened is building. is when the animation was done on Cauldron. They needed help painting cells, so I was still there. We were painting cells. You now, you, were us. you in the animation building painting mm -hmm. cells? Yep. Oh, my God. Yeah, because they were, like, so backed they were, up they had in their building. Then the funny thing is, they were moving. Most people were gone in the animation building. And I'm painting cells on my animation desk, and I have a air vent that probably hasn't been cleaned out since 1940-whatever. 
and above me they're demolishing offices. And so I'm painting cells and boom, boom, here all the stuff. Dust is coming yeah, I'm down. like, and I'm coming back after lunch on my cells. There's like all this black soot. Like, what's <laughs> just coming? What's all, where are all these black dots on my cells? And I'm realizing it's coming it's from, from above. The, yeah, all that <laughs> soot from Walt Smoke, who knows what it's from. You know, that's come raining down on my cells. But we stayed there and finished painting cells. They were on, I remember most of the cells seemed to be big because I guess they shot in CinemaScope or whatever. So yeah, it was, was widescreen. Yeah, everything was widescreen, wide so the cells were real big. But they gave us pretty easy stuff to paint. They didn't give us any of the real difficult things. So, yeah, I had never painted cells before, so that was a, a new experience. So when you finish painting cells, you're, you're out of the building. Shipped over to Flower Street. So, what was your reaction when you went over there? Because I remember mine was oh, no. like, "What? There's like no doors. We all had. We were in cubicle. What? Cubicle was like. What? How can we go work from like offices this? to? How can we work cubes. like this? They said, "Oh no, there's offices. Are there doors? Oh yeah, there's doors. Well, there was a door, but there's no swinging door. It's just a hole. Yeah, it's just you a know, doorway. A hole in the wall. It's a doorway. There's no door. There's a hole in the wall. That's With not a, a door. sheet. Exactly. No, not even. They didn't even have a sheet. So anyway, yeah, we're over there. By the time I got there, though, they had upgraded. I think the first people in there were they were really sort bad. of so. Oh yeah, it was really was bad. But, but we got we you know because we were painting cells, we got there a few months later. So at that point, they not that it was perfect, but it was better than the first you know, like marine. The first marines in were under sniper fire. Well, and then the you moved bit. into the and then it expanded. You moved into those other buildings across the street. And yeah, that that took time. You know, mouse detective was done in that. Pretty much that one building, and then. Uh, well, the crew was still small. The crew was small, and that's when yeah the whole Michael Eisner takeover happened. Yeah, you know, that was on Cauldron that happened, and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg came in, and Peter Schneider, and those guys, all that group. Came what's in. your What's your early What's your early memories of Jeffrey in those days? Did he come over and give pep talks? And yeah, you know, we were like we were real skeptical. We didn't trust any. You know, we didn't trust these new guys. We're like, oh, who are these guys? They're live action guys. They don't understand animation, and you know, how who are they? You know, telling us how to do this. You know, we 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 have a real passion for this stuff. These guys are just in here. So I think <laughs> I think you know, as time went by, maybe that was maybe it was true a little bit at the beginning. You know, and then I think as they saw the energy and the the talent and the passion we had, I think the types of movies we could make, I think they started you know appreciating you know seeing what could be done with this medium that we all loved because you know the people making it the artists were really in there for the love of it because I remember when I going back to when I first got into Cal Arts I remember my dad sending me an article from Life magazine about Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings and one of the lines said something like in five years no one will be making these kinds of movies it's just too costly they don't make enough money so Lord you know he wrong. yeah so the idea was like animation was you know, archaic and it was going out and no one was going to do it so I think that was a kind of a prevalent attitude at that time because Disney hadn't had a really big, big hit in a long time, and and uh, you know Fox and Hound did well, really well, and and then as you know Great Mouse was a good film, it didn't do as well as the studio wanted, but then you know then of course you go later on, things started really taking off. So I think as these films started getting more notoriety and started making more money, then people's eyes started opening and started seeing things that. We as artists and people have passion for the medium, kind of knew intuitively. You know, we knew what what could be. You know, that these things could really be great again, like they once were. So. Yeah. Now, when you okay, so your when what were your first animation assignments? You because you're well, you're rough great in mouse, and that's like, a sort yeah. of roadmap up into. Yeah, animation. I got into Great Mouse. Actually, I did a little bit. Of, I remember doing a little bit of cleanup. On Great Mouse, which I I didn't have the uh, fortitude for cleanup. It's a different mindset, you know, to do cleanup. And maybe my drawing skill wasn't quite at the level it should be. The really quality of the line. Yeah, line. I I like just doing a more spontaneous kind of gritty line. I, I feel more comfortable with that. Well, that's kind of the Glenn Keane school. Where he yeah, a little bit like it. Glenn. I mean, I'm not comparing my drawings to Glenn, but not by any stretch. Glenn's an amazing draftsman, but um, I just like drawing a little looser, a little more spontaneous, getting a little bit more something of my own yeah, yeah, yeah. gesture and in life into that drawing where cleanup, I feel like you're always following someone else and trying to retain what they've got somehow and yet making it a pretty drawing. So that to me was a little difficult for me to get that. But I, I did a little bit of cleanup. But then 
later on as Great Mouse went on, I, I did start getting some crowd shots, like all the little mice far in the distance and crowd reactions to Radigan, like, oh. I did a lot oh, of, that's oh, right. When, he, huh? when he's yeah. rolling out his list. Yeah, and then this queen it starts, the queen starts uh, doing weird stuff, and they're like, ooh, they're like, what's going on? Like, all that kind of so stuff. So you, you were involved in all those reactions. I did most of those. I did a couple those were of good. It's okay. You know, you look back on it, it's like, not that good, but it's they for, were, you know. They did what they needed to do. They did what do. they needed to do. And I, but I did get a few scenes of ba- Basil and Radic, uh, Basil and Dawson running, and uh, Queen Mouse Toria. I did a couple scenes with her. I think one of where Fidget's lifting her up, and it's like a close up of her eyes getting wider as she sees the cat. Cat wait for you know, he's going to throw her into the cat's mouth. So I did a couple scenes of her in there, and uh, yeah. So that's first animation. I love that. To me, I was like, yeah, I could do this. This is fun. The first, I yes. love this. <laughs> this was really cool. So. Uh, what happened then after Great Mouse, there was a huge layoff at the studio because of all the new regime, all the eyes and your people. They didn't know what they, they were going to do. They were like re-examining, okay, what do we do from this point? You know, Great Mouse had already been in the works, so they felt like committed to making that movie. I don't even know if Oliver and Company, I don't know where that was. Maybe it was that, that was actually in early development. Yeah, it was, it was probably very early on, but it was not by any stretch of the imagination ready for crew so how long were you off well i was there they kept me oh they kept they you, kept so me i was like wow i was like one of the few people they kept was like really well, all they right must have, they must have thought highly of you highly enough i i never assume anything That's right, right. <laughs> never assume any of that stuff i just was thankful to have be there and 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 have a job and and i saw it as a real opportunity again kind of looking forward i i knew i wanted to animate and i saw you needed to do a test, you know, you needed to do an animation test. You wanted really to jump through some hoops. Yeah, and I had already started a Roger Rabbit test. This was with an early version of Roger Rabbit uh, when Daryl Van Sitters was directing oh, and yeah. uh, Chris Buck Designs. Mike really, Giamo was involved. Mike Giamo, in yeah, they were the really early Roger Rabbits. So it's not the Roger Rabbit that's in the movie. It's, he had a bigger nose. more like a screwy squirrel. Yeah, yeah. Big round nose, and he was taller and skinnier and... At any rate, I had already started a kind of a test with Roger and had a s- simple little story. It was like more than one scene. I just figured I'd do like three or four scenes. Yeah. So there was about a year. It was about a full year that we had no production work. So it was just like do, You're doing experimental Do animation. what you guys need to do. Learn, get better, you know. So I took that as the, the green light to, okay, this is... You know, I had this test already started. I think I had done one scene and maybe started another. So, okay, I'm going to spend, if it takes a whole year, I'm just going to make so this So how many animation. scenes did you do? It's like four scenes, something like that. Uh, and I, you know, just worked it, worked it, you know. No, what was people. your approach? This is the thing I wanted to get into. What was your approach? I mean, this is early on in your animation yeah. career. Do you remember what your approach or what your angle on animation that you were doing then was? Well... Probably not a very good one. I mean, I think I learned more about planning later on. This, to me, was more... Maybe, I think I maybe had some crude storyboard I had done on what the whole idea was. I don't know if I really thumbed at, thumbnailed out my scenes. I don't remember doing that. Yeah. I think I maybe just had a general idea of what I wanted to do and then just sort of did it, Yeah. Uh, which... I do not recommend now. I would never do it. I would never approach it that way nowadays, knowing the things I know. Now I always thumbnail out my scene unless it's something that's really simple and I have an absolute idea of what I want. You know, The main thing, I think, is you need to know absolutely what it is you're going to do in the scene before you start. How do you do, because Wolfgang Ratherman brought this up on several occasions. He said, Steve... Some animators do pose to pose. This is in their straight-ahead animation. He said, I was always a straight-ahead animator. Right. I started at the beginning and rolled through it. Yeah. And do you take both approaches, or do you... Uh... I, I would say 90, 95, 99% of the time I'm doing a pose to pose yeah. animation. Uh, the exception would be as if you have some kind of quick action that's kind of eccentric or I don't know something to me going straight ahead 
is a much more visceral approach. Yeah. And to get really kind of substantial acting, that's hard. It's hard because I think getting your poses really kind of gives you those anchor points. Okay, okay, I've got this acting pose, got that acting pose, and then how I work between those. That can really build your beats and your rhythm to your scene. Uh, where straight ahead, you can kind of do that, but there's something about having a pose that's like your anchor yeah. point, your your pillar, your support. To me, that's the way I look at it. You put your foundation down first. When you're building a house, you need that foundation. If you start building without really having that See, foundation, have, it's tough. How the old-timers did it, I have no idea. Outside of Wooly's telling me that, and then Frank saying about Wooly, not about, he did not about his own animation, but he said, we used to look at Wooly's Anna first animation test and they were blobs. We couldn't tell what they yeah. were. But I and think that's how he, he discovered it. I, I think. And and when that, you yeah, at, and that was the yeah. point. He said yeah, yeah. that Wooly would go, okay, now I know what I'm doing. He'd have to yeah. go through it once. Yeah. And when you look at it, well, isn't Wooly's roughs the ones with all the different colored pencils? He would like do a blue pass and a red pass. Yeah, and, and he. Yellow and he, pass and an orange pass. And a, the, the only thing that he talked to me about was that and then also the fact that on. He was ticked off because he did the magic mirror in Snow White. Right. And he said he was ticked off because he said, I spent months and months doing that. And then Walt put a distortion glass over yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was, you know, and he, he just said, <laughs> you know, he folded the paper to get the ellipse and then to uh, get the head right. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he just said, uh, and he put this distortion glass over <laughs> it. So yeah. he was happy, unhappy about yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, every animator has some kind of a story like that. They hid my hid my great animation with all those effects. You know, that's right. That, you know, oh, I'm sure that happened that, to you at yeah, some point, right? You know, something. There's always something. There's always something to get upset about. But so you did the Roger Rabbit, and that's the year. Did the Roger Rabbit test? Uh, yeah, for it took about a year to finish that off. I remember Peter Schneider walking by once when I was looking at one of my tests. He's like, "Oh, it should do this." He's giving me notes, looking at it like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't, think, I don't think I did what he told me, but I just remember him well, telling me some notes. You didn't do what Jack Hannon was. Yeah, I don't know. Either. I guess it's the rebel in me. You know? <laughs> it's like, if it resonates with me, I'm more than happy. But it's, and that's something I've had to overcome, I think, personality wise. It's, especially starting out, sometimes it was hard for me to like have critiques on my work. And it's, as you grow and learn, it's that's part of the process. And, Sure. You have to, if you're going to be in this business, you've, you've got, got to learn to. You got to do it. You got to do graciously it. Graciously accept. Yeah, you've got to work with the directors, especially or whoever you're working with, supervising animator, whatever, whoever it is. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I still have a little bit of that re- rebellious side, I guess. But um, so yeah, I did the Roger Rabbit test, and at that time submitted. I think it was like the first official review board, you know, of anim people to promote to animator, and it was reviewed, and I got you know this list of comments. Of course, it's not named. You know, doesn't say who said what comment, and some people really liked it, some people hated it, some people were like, yeah, it's pretty good, but he could learn more. Stuff. So I think overall, they must have liked it because I got a promotion to animator. At oh, terrific! Point. So you're a full animator going full into animator to heading, Oliver, heading into Oliver and Company. Although the detour was, um, we were already starting uh, on like Black Cauldron and uh, Great Mouse computer animation was starting to come in with like Clockworks and Great Mouse. Black Cauldron had some the boats, the rowboats, and little things like that. And yeah, yeah. Black Cauldron were done with CG. So they were sending some of us to computer classes and, and the SIGGRAPH. And we went to the SIGGRAPH, I think, I forget which one it was, either Anaheim or Dallas, but it was the John Lasseter, the Luxo was shown. And it was just like the reaction, that was like the premiere of Luxo Jr. And it was like the reaction to that was the audience went crazy. Really? Yeah. Yes, I was there at the premiere of Luxo Junior at SIGGRAPH. And people you were there at the bonkers. you were there at the dawn of the age. Yeah, people went bonkers. So I turned. Uh, we were there with all these tech guys. I'm like, why aren't we doing that? Like that's what we should be doing. <laughs> and so, sure enough, you know, we get back to the studio and like uh, a few weeks to a month later, they say, yeah, we're gonna, you know, Tony, we're gonna do a short. You know, we're gonna do a CG short. So, and they say, you know, you want to be part of it? I'm just like, yeah, sure. You know, so I submitted an idea and. Yeah, a bunch of people, they wanted ideas submitted for a short. I think they picked, like, a Gary Trousdale idea. This was oil spot and lipstick, which has never been shown in public. I think it was only shown at SIGGRAPH, like, the following year. And they don't even mention... If you look, it's funny, because I was looking at the... 
Oil spot Wiki- and lipstick. Oil spot and lipstick. If you look on the Wikipedia page for the Disney shorts, it's on there. And there's a little asterisk. It's only at Sig- only shown at SIGGRAPH. But it's the first fully animated Disney film ever. Fully CG. animated. All CG. It's all CG. Wow. And did you animate it? I on animated it? on it. It was all wireframe. There was no, you know, you saw through the characters and I did some animation. It's, it's a junkyard dog. He's a junk, Loyal Spot's the junkyard dog. Lipstick's his girlfriend. She's a junk, junkyard dog and they're made of junk. They're dogs, but they're all like a uh, dustbuster nose and oh, okay. And, That's the so game. they're all junk. And uh, anyway, I don't want to ruin it for you. At some point, you'll see it. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah. So I animated on that. So that's it's funny because how long was it? Six minutes? Yeah, it's short. Something like that. Five six minutes. But it's funny because it's like my first. I was an animator, and the first thing I animated was, was a CG. CG. And then I totally didn't go in that direction. I, everything else I did was was hand drawn just because I my love for drawing I just always wanted to draw, to draw the CG stuff it was a it was okay it wasn't it didn't ring my bell like a cool drawing like yeah, yeah something yeah, about yeah. when you do a drawing and it's a nice drawing it's like whoa there's like a feedback boom and there's something really nice about that yeah know, from absolutely. nothing a blank piece of paper and you can draw this little thing and it's like there and then it's and then you start flipping it and it's like Oh my gosh, this thing is starting to emote and act and come to life from nothing, from blank paper. To, it's almost like being a god, you know, it's like creating this thing that's alive. So, anyway, we worked on that and, and uh, I was, we did so that. How long was that? Six months? Uh, yeah. Four so, months? I don't even know if it was that long. It seemed pretty quick. Once we animated it, it went very fast. And Ruben Aquino worked on it. Mike Sedino directed. I remember Brian Clift. Uh, I think he did a little bit of animation. Bernie Mattinson was like an advisor. Tina Price worked on it. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, all these people who worked on it. I mean, there's Tad... Tad... Uh, Tad Stone? No, Tad Gilo was oh. a technical tech, tech guy on it. Huh. Yeah. And, yeah, so anyway, we did that, and it was next, yeah, SIGGRAPH next year. They and then you, it. what did you they, segue into right after that? Then uh, Oliver and Company worked with Mike Gabriel pretty closely. I think it was like a sequence. And what director. were your main characters on that? Oliver and Dodger around? primarily. Oh, okay. Worked with Mike. Uh, Mike's you know amazing, amazing artist. Some, he did really great animation of. And there was some. CG he did some great that. animation on Great Mouse with the uh, dog, uh, Toby and the cat. All this great running stuff. That's squashy, straight to great stuff. So he went on to Oliver and Company and worked with him quite a bit on, on a bunch of different sequences. It's a nice film, Oliver. And yeah, Company. it worked, turned out okay. I know. It's and funny because some well people say oh, I hate. Office. What's that? Did pretty well at the box. Yeah, office. it was the biggest uh, animated film at the time when it came out. And I, you know, you hear people say, oh, I hate that film. I hated working on this. I don't want to work on that. I don't know. I always felt like, hey, it was my first film to animate. I was having fun, you know. I was getting to animate stuff and, and learn and then make these characters come to life. I felt the same way about Black Cauldron. You know, people were so many people working on the Black Cauldron. It's like, ah, oh, it's terrible and. It was like my first real movie, you know, first feature I worked on. So for so me, it was were, like, and they're paying, me, they're paying me to work on this. You know, so I'm drawing. You know, what's not to like? You know, I'm working with cool people, <laughs> or creative people. So it's, you know, nothing nothing wrong with that. So yeah, Oliver and Company was good. And then after that comes Mermaid, right? And Little Mermaid was the one after that. And, and that's a huge film. Well, yeah, I think, uh, and I think some people have mentioned this is the... F- time I knew Mermaid was going to be good, really, really good, was before I even saw much of the film, was uh, Howard Ashman had us all in the theater and just played the demos of the songs, his, him and, and Al Menken, and, you know, Howard was singing all the characters, and Al was playing, and maybe singing here and there, and Al and, uh, Howard Ashman just pitched the whole story, you know walked us through the story and you could just say it's like wow this is you already know this is this is gonna, gonna be, be good real. the music is amazing it's just gonna be a great great film great great project to be on so